Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, online event to celebrate the launch of Patricia's new book, Gendered Hierarchies uh, of Dependency, uh, Women Making Partnership and Accountancy Firms. Uh, the book explores how organizational hierarchies are, uh, gen are negotiated across borders, and it looks at the persistent, or as Patricia puts it in her book, the stickiness of underrepresentation of women in top positions in professional service firms. And of course, her focus is the large global accounting firms. Uh, Patricia's book is a new take on an old issue and she has sought to draw our attention to the specific cases of the UK and Germany. So before we get into what promises to be a really interesting discussion, I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Uh, I'm very pleased, of course, to welcome Patricia herself. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in organisation studies here at Queen Mary. Uh, and she's also a member of the Centre for Research, Inequality and Diversity. Patricia holds a PhD in Gender Studies from the LSC. And as if to really draw attention to the issues faced by working women everywhere and the subject of her own research, I am pretty sure that Patricia will not mind uh, my sharing the fact that she herself is due to have a baby in less than three weeks. Congratulations, Patricia. Next, I'd like to introduce you all to Professor Elizabeth Killen, who's a Professor of Leadership and Organization at uh, uh, the University of Essex. She currently holds uh, a Leverhulme uh, Trust Major Research Fellowship to explore the future of work, digitalization, and gender. She's an author of four books, most recently, Men Stepping Forward, uh, Leading Your Organization on the Path to Inclusion. Welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, finally, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Katharina Liu, who is a partner with Ernst & Young, uh, leading the German Change and Learning Team. She's based just outside of Frankfurt and is also responsible for the uh, change experience community in Europe, the Middle East, India and Africa. Uh, what an interesting additional to the panel. Uh, welcome, Katharina. So we'll start today with a short introduction from uh, Patricia, followed by a number of broader questions. And at the end, we will have a question and answer session. Uh, please, can I ask all the participants to post your questions um, on the uh, questions section of Zoom rather than in the chat? And we can come uh, to them and pick them up at the end. So uh, over to you, Patricia. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sophie, and thank you to Elizabeth and Katarina for your time and support um, as well. And um, yeah, so for, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the main findings of the book and um, what the book is about. Um, so for this project, I interviewed um, female partners in Germany and the UK, and over the years, I published some of the results in journal articles, so one on sexism, one on how to make partnership and one on mothering and accounting. Um, but these all cover the, these sort of topics in a very insular way. And so the book has really given me an opportunity to think across the themes and to go beyond, you know, counting, counting women at work. So for example, I'm thinking, sorry, I'm often out of breath with um, uh, baby. So for example, if you look just at the proportion of women across the accountancy profession, so chartered um, accountants and chartered certified accountants in the UK and Wirtschaftsprüfer in, in, in Germany, you can see that there's a lot more women. The proportion of women in the UK is much higher. It's about 37% compared to 18. And so there's a lot of reasons for this difference actually that are related to how the profession is organized differently. And I talk a lot about this in chapter two of the book. Um, and then if you look at the stories the women told, so their career histories, um, in my research, um, it showed that making partnership, you know, requires a lot of hard work in both countries, but that comparatively in Germany, relationships um, remained more important than in the UK, where the focus was much more on structures and understanding procedures um, and the procedures that are in place. And also... Mm -hmm being encouraged to think about yourself a bit as an asset, understanding it and communicating your market value appropriately in what is conceived to be a competitive marketplace. So very much in line with the critical literature on neoliberalism, on uh, workers being turned into human capital and so forth. Now in Germany, the focus was much more on trusting one another. So again, I'm speaking comparatively. So this was more in the smaller firms, particularly 
where partnership was also often compared to um, being a marriage and sort of akin to a marriage. And of course, we know from you know decades of research that these sort of networks are more difficult on average for women to penetrate. Um, and there's definitely a science element here. So this is much less the case in the big four firms. Um, and so on the surface, my first conclusion at the time was really like, you know, this is so much better in the UK and, and women in the UK were making all the right noises. So they were talking about firms needing to do more to push, get more women into partnership. They were more likely to deal with sexism in a firm way and challenge it. And they had more children and a higher proportion of them had children and sort of 60% compared to 40%. But again, these are, you know, we've only got a number of 60. So childcare was really interestingly um, treated as a private matter in the UK as well. And in half of the cases where children were present, it was actually the fathers that were looking after children or were the primary caretakers and had either downshifted their own work or gone part-time or given up work completely in order to organize family life. And, and so I thought that was, you know, all very much what we would like to think of as progressive. So I was really drawn to this conclusion that, you know, things were a lot better for you, women in the UK. And it was only through like book working through the book um, that I also started to realize that I was drawing this conclusion as someone, you know, who had been trained and had spent a very long time in a liberal, liberal market economy. And that has really influenced my own thinking about um, what equality and fairness should look like and sort of valuing notions of independence, being mobile, of sameness, and uh, not being beholden to what other people think. And I think sort of conceiving yourself as autonomous, really, um, because that is also what comes with, you know, the relationships that the women talked about in Germany, that the more you know each other and the more interdependent you are, the more opinions people have about how you should be living your life um, because it affects them. And so trust also comes with norms and boundaries. And it's already only really since having children myself that I could be a bit more sympathetic as well to what the women in Germany were telling me or a little bit more open-minded in my interpretation, I think, um, when they were saying, you know, things like, well, if you have children as a woman, you may want to see them and your presence matters and ideally you would work part-time. And um, that is actually quite dismissive of the work that mothers do to pretend that it doesn't matter or that it isn't a trade-off. And very firmly also understanding it as, to, as a gendered trade-off. Um, and so this struck me as terribly regressive at the time. Um, and I started being a little bit more open-minded in my reading and um, thinking about um, equality and you know fairness. And um, also understanding a little bit better that feminist visions of equality are actually quite historically quite fractured across borders and to be a bit more critical also about interrogating the motives behind proceduralizing everything in the name of fairness and equality and asking what is the cost of you know giving up on these relationship-based hierarchies so for example in germany the partners were very secure you know they didn't challenge every inappropriate comments they and sometimes when i said well why didn't you <laughs> why didn't you uh, challenge this they were actually quite dismissive like well it didn't, it didn't matter um, but on the other hand they would take issue when they encountered behaviors that they considered to be disrespectful towards the status not as a woman but as a professional and so some of them recounted very quickly reaching for the phone and calling people that they knew at other firms they were all impeccably networked and usually securing other positions quite quickly um, in the UK, on the other hand, a quite significant proportion of the women I interviewed, the partners I interviewed, talked about redundancies. And some even suffered redundancies themselves, even at partnership level. And in those cases, they did feel that there was a bias there and that the appraisal and performance management systems had been used against them in a gendered way. And actually, I really look forward to talking to Elizabeth about this more because I know she's doing some really exciting research about the role of artificial intelligence in perpetuating gender inequality in the workplace. Um, but I think by widening my reading and also um, re learning a lot about ethics of care feminisms and some of Richard Sennett's work. Um, so Richard Sennett is a sociologist who has written extensively about corrosive aspects of managerialism. And we can really see this here. So the women who were let go, even though it's a partnership le uh, level, were told, you know, there was nothing the firm could do. Um, they were, the sim you know, simply the weakest link in a falling economy. And worse, they were expected to go quietly and um, in a contained manner. And so employers were very much refusing to take responsibility 
about the havoc they were causing in people's lives. And it is pushed back into the performance management system and then ultimately pushed back into the women. And they are told, you know, they've done it to themselves. So for me, really, the book offered a good opportunity to look at this in a more contextualized manner and to say that, well, yes, there are more women in the UK. It's easier for them to get to the top because I think a lot of the structures, they almost um, act like guiding ropes on a hillside and they help women, um, you know, sort of understand how to manage their way to the top. But they're not safety nets. And I think that that is actually a big cost to pay. Um, and I've also come to conclude from that, that, um, you know, the price for making it to the very top is still often motherhood um, in both contexts. And so either by not having children, as we've seen in six out of, you know, sort of 60% of the cases in Germany, or um, through a role reversal and gender role reversal and working like normative fathers would. And I think, you know, if we look at the numbers across the population where eight out of 10 of us have children and the very real sacrifices that many women and some men make to be there for their children, including taking jobs that are beyond, you know, below your capacity um, to secure the hours that can help facilitate a sustainable family life, then I think we have to conclude that, you know, unless this comes down in its cost, um, that things aren't going to change significantly at the top. And we've really seen the numbers at the very top stalling despite much better access. Um, so yeah, so that's what I bring out in the book. What I try to do to consider this um, sort of these two different modes of capitalism and to think about it more, not so much what is better for women, but what is the cost of, of each from a gender perspective in each country. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Suki. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That was that's really uh, an interesting start. Uh, and actually, it lays the foundation for the rest of the discussion. So thank you for that. So let's open it up to the panel and um, address one of the questions um, uh, for the panel. Perhaps we can have a think about this. Um, what can firms do to increase the proportion of women at the top? So uh, happy to hear your thoughts. Um, shall I come to you, Elizabeth, first? Sure. Um, first of all, congratulations, Patricia, on this fantastic book. I had the pleasure of reading an early version. Um, so um, I really very much um, enjoyed reading it. And obviously, I'm very familiar with your work. So in case you haven't picked it up, it's really a wonderful piece of research that weaves together the lived experiences of women in um, the UK and Germany and links it back to the academic theory and you know offers quite a novel take on some of the issues that are not new at all. And I think that's, you know, also how I want to um, answer this question. I mean, the idea that, you know, there is one quick fix of increasing the number of women at the top in professional services firms or, you know, in the economy more widely, um, or, you know, in fact, in any leadership position is not, you know, straightforward. And, you know, many organizations try to find this magic wand and say, okay, we just need to solve these two issues and then are sorted. And we know from our research and from you know, the practice, um, you know, that many organizations have engaged in over the last decades was very committed diversity and inclusion professionals, that it is not that easy, right? So it's much more complex, um, and it will take much longer than we often think. Um, when we reflect on these ideas, I often think, you know, I'll come back to three um, key pillars or issues. Um, the first is senior leadership support, right? So something we hear very regularly. We need senior leaders to support gender equality efforts to ensure that we have more women at the top. It's easier said than done. Um, the second element is around promotion practices, and that's particularly pertinent in professional services firms where criteria for promotion and particular for making partner are often shrouded in secrecy and are not as transparent. So just making them a bit more transparent and giving women the possibility of fulfilling these criteria has shown really good success um, in professional services firms that I've seen. And then finally, um, you know, we also need to look at the right metrics. And very often we, we tend to look at this outcome measure, how many women do we have at the top of the organization? And I often encourage moving away from that and rather looking at the developmental pathway that women take on their journey to leadership and rather putting a percentage on that. So if you know that you have to do some leadership development training and you know that only 5% of the participants you know, are women, you might want to increase 
reset or develop an alternative program that's more appealing to women. Similarly, if you know you need to lead business critical projects as it is very central in professional services firms, think about how can women get a fair share of these projects and what systems and structures need to be in place to facilitate that. So that would be you know, some ideas of how we can work towards that, but it's obviously you know, a very long and lengthy process. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Katharina, perhaps I can come to you. Of course you may. And um, before I answer that question, I would also want to um, extend a big uh, uh, round of uh, applause to Patricia for, um, you know, um, putting all the effort into this research um, endeavor. Um, I told you when you asked me uh, to join the panel that I would be more than happy to do so because I think it's such an important topic to look at, um, particularly, you know, from my personal point of view, speaking as a female partner in Germany uh, in a big four firm myself, and also um, being fortunate enough to helping other women uh, become partner um, over the last couple of years. Um, so I think it's a very important thing to talk about here. Um, when it comes to what can firms actually do to um, increase the numbers or keep women in those positions, um, personally speaking, I can say that, you know, having role models has been, for me, one of the most important things in my career. So actually having women in these positions that I could literally, to be honest, observe as they are, um, you know, um, working in these roles has been one of the key elements of me wanting to become partner and also believing in the fact that if they could do it, I could probably do it too, right? So I would say the role modeling aspect is absolutely critical. And then, you know, as a change manager, I need to talk about this probably, but also the way you position these women and the, uh, the plenary you give to them, um, the way you let them speak within an organization, uh, the way you give them a platform and let them tell their stories I think also is um, extremely important, particularly for young women, because what we often see is that, at least in the German practice, that women tend to make a key decision um, when there is a move between the senior consultant to the manager's role. And uh, you want to make sure that, you know, you accompany women across the entire career path and also give them a valid understanding of what it actually means becoming a partner on the one hand side, but also being a partner on the other side, which from my personal experience is two completely different things. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really important point and it's something that um, Patricia uh, spoke about when she talked about um, guiding ropes on a hillside, uh, which was a lovely term, I thought, um, to, to bring to this. Uh, Patricia, uh, can I come to you, perhaps? You're on mute. I'm probably less uh, practically minded here, but I, I would say that um, I think for me, really, this so I've come to the conclusions that we really have to take a step back in understanding careers really as long games. And, um, you know, we probably, a lot of us probably will be working till 70 now, or at least that's what mortgage providers seem to think. And so we're looking at careers that span, you know, 45 to 50 years, and that is a very long time. And I think the focus from the human resource management industry on, again, proceduralizing everything in the name of equality, that we need to be a little bit wary of this. And um, also um, sort of consider the the ways in which performance management systems are generally a prioritizing performance over experience and merit over tenure, for example, really shifts employers' capacity into a short-term frame. And I think also shifts the capacity away from being able to cope with the human life cycle and also restricting employees' um, capacity to alternate gears a little bit over the course of your career. You know, you think um, Katarina was talking just about these crucial you know, the sort of time between, you know, when you were sort of seen a consultant, for example. And I think, you know, people do have to invest time in building a domestic life and finding a partner and having children, supporting these children. And it is affecting more women now because there are more women in the labor force. And so it's also affecting more companies, uh, more families. And I think we, you know, we talk a lot about flexible working, but then when we're looking at um, solutions like the four day working week, for example, it seems to it seems to think that most of us don't really like spending any time with our children or 
you know, I think the pressure points for most families um, are the dissonance between annual leave and school holidays. And then that we're supposed to be, you know, schools running six hours, but we're supposed to be working eight hours plus commuting time. And I'm not saying that the answer is to keep children in poorly funded schools for longer, but to make policies at an organizational and a national level that are sort of genuine in understanding that for a very short period of time, comparatively to the 45 years that we're supposed to be working, um, uh, you know, the population, men and women, um, have to maybe, you know, prioritize something else. Um, at a crucial stage also in the career. So we're looking at sort of early 30s to mid 40s, really, where exiting the labor market or downshifting is really difficult to reverse in the um, in its effects. And it's mostly women that, um, you know, take these sacrifices and are currently carrying the costs. And I just think we need to um, step away from it being such a trade-off between, you know, missing being out uh, sort of, missing out and being there for your children on the one hand or losing everything you've worked for on the other hand. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I agree with that. I, I mean, I'm just going to uh, sort of uh, put something out there. Uh, Patricia talked a little bit about flexibility uh, and flexible working. And uh, certainly from my own research, I've come across, you know, spoken to women who have come back to flexible working mode in large accounting firms and, uh, you know, some of them are in tears. Um, they feel like they're treated as second class citizens. They don't get the jobs that perhaps they might have had prior to, um, you know, uh, uh, taking that flexible role. Um, and some of them actually, because they're on flexible hours, they end up doing far more hours than they might have done um, otherwise. I just wondered if Elizabeth or Katharina might have a comment on that before we move on. Um, I'm happy to start. Um, I I think that, again, from personal experience, what I can resonate is that, you know, giving women um, the, the flexibility time-wise across their career is absolutely essential, right? And this is a flexibility that, for me, relates to timing. So when do I work? But also from where can I work? And I think in that respect, particularly the consulting business, has profited so much from, you know, that shift that has happened um, uh, because of COVID-19. Um, whereas women struggled so much more before the pandemic because we were literally traveling mostly. Um, and now we can do so much more remotely. I think that has tremendously helped. Um, the, the firm that I work for offers um, a large range of um, models that you can pick and choose from in terms of when you work and you can change between them as you go. And I think also that flexibility that you do not need to stick to your decision that you've made, but that you can like adapt and learn during the process and then kind of dial up, dial down, um, change the days or whatever is absolutely essential in you know um, retaining this these female talents um, because then they can kind of also feel themselves into the new role which motherhood is right and 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 have that as a, like a kind of almost oscillating between the job and the private life and see where is that that fine line that I want to hit so that it works out for me I think having that is a key factor for women in in in, in their careers in consulting now. Sure thanks Katharina. Uh, Elizabeth anything to add? Sure um, I think what we um, are realizing is that, you know, for, for the longest time, you know, this flexibility was largely afforded to working mothers. They created what is often called in the literature the mummy track. And that is, you know, by default creating second class citizens, right? Because the norm is not changing. And what I've, you know, discovered looking much more at the future of work and how we expect it to work in the future, not only that we have to will be able to work longer and have to pace ourselves to um, sustain, you know, being a, in good working condition for longer but also more flexibility is becoming the norm for everyone right and you know obviously the pandemic was a pivotal point where we had this you know large scale experiment to see how these things work um, but we're still not quite sure how things fall but if you look further ahead at what work is going to be available what type of jobs humans will do where we will have more support you know from machines in particular artificial intelligence um, then you know we will see that 
it is becoming the norm for everyone. And I think that is a great opportunity um, to see more flexibility um, in general, rather than creating flexibility for one specific group in the workplace. Yeah, thanks. That's a really important point. Okay, I'm just going to uh, change the direction of the discussion a little bit and come back to Patricia. And perhaps you can talk to us um, a little bit about what we can learn from how hierarchies in professional service firms um, are negotiated um, in other countries. Uh, obviously, your research um, uh, compared the UK and Germany. So perhaps you can share some of your insights. Um, yeah, so I think also it actually ties up with some of the things. I think as you can see, there's a question by um, Anne Turnison that I might um, tie in there here, who's asking, can you reflect a little bit more about the details and differences and similarities between the workplace struggles of women with and without children? Um, and I think some of the things that Elizabeth was saying as well <clears throat> about sustaining sustaining a good working condition for longer. I think um, I can just see my crumbling body. Um, well, and I think what I think is really a problem in the UK or what I've come to think of more of a problem is this performance culture and short terminism that I was talking about it earlier, because I think it really chips away at workplaces being meaningful places where we spend, you know, most of our waking hours. And, um, you know, I was reading a book, a feminist book a few years ago about resilience, and the author was writing about how women were historically denied the opportunity to fulfill themselves at work. And, you know, obviously, that is that's a good point. But I also think that it really um, looks at work in a quite sort of very rose-tinted way if we're thinking about the realities of work in modern Britain and especially in liberal market economies such as the US or the UK, where certainly I think by the time we hit our mid-40s, a lot of us have um, suffered grave disappointments and are often facilitated by systems that are designed to absolve leaders from having to take responsibility for the difficult decisions that they are making and that carry real human costs. So in my research, certainly, <clears throat> and you look at the UK respondents, um, a lot more of them, or there was a more consistent narrative about talking about work-related stress, about ill health, and about wondering how to reorient your life to give uh, meaning for the last, you know, sort of 20 years once you have a chief partnership. And I think that in Germany, in contrast, you know, the cost of making partnership clearly is too high. Yeah, it's clearly very difficult to become a partner as well. Um, and it shouldn't be this difficult. Um, but the women that I was speaking to were very, um, they were working with people that they liked, that they've known for a long time, they were, um, that they trusted, they'd been there a long time with these people. And this is again, you know, what, what um, Anne is asking, you know, a lot of them were childless, but they were taking a lot of meaning and a lot of pride out of their work and creating these organizations and being creative in that way. And I think um, that employers in the UK can really take a little bit out of that. <clears throat> Um, thank you. Um, can I turn to the uh, other panelists, perhaps Elizabeth first, um, to yeah. share any thoughts on that? I think it's, you know, particularly when we talk about um, cross-country comparisons um, and comparisons um, amongst different um, individuals within those countries, it is very easy to fall into the trap that Patricia described so well, you know, one is better than the other. And, you know, I've seen that quite a lot. I mean, if we stay with the UK and Germany example, I've heard that a lot of Germany is behind and, you know, German in Germany, we have very few um, female partners. We need to help them to catch up. And of course, you know, that's certainly a mentality that, you know, in other areas, you know, we would have stepped away from seeing that there's a clear development path on how you need to develop in order to be successful. Um, at the same time, you know, while I have this realization that we need to look at benefits and drawbacks in each of the systems, um, sometimes when you work in Germany and you work with institutions, I've done a lot of work recently, not with professional services firms, but with universities, this is a very, very traditional environment and the mindset in many of the individuals are still very, very different to um, something that we haven't seen in the UK, uh, at least, you know, not in the time that I've been in, in the UK workplace. Um, so it's kind of, you know, um, the sentiment of, you know, yes, UK, you know, has many advantages, but also, you know, not falling into the trap of necessarily saying that you know, other countries um, lag behind. 
Um, and then I also see, you know, when we look globally, I mean, I've done a lot of work, you know, in the Middle East um, and, you know, seeing that there are kind of different issues um, in Africa, different issues come to the fore in professional services firms, in companies in general, where we can clearly see that the local context and the local culture has um, a huge impact in creating either different classes of individuals and organizations, but also creating what is possible, what is permissible, what you can and can't do. And um, we need to have, you know, this awareness that the cultural context, of course, differs without necessarily falling into the trap that we all need to develop like the US or the UK um, or even some other West. Um, countries. So kind of keeping um, that in mind, which obviously is, you know, um, not easy, particularly, you know, knowing how these partnerships are structured as well. Thank you. Um, Katharina, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, you may have seen me nodding uh, quite a few times when Patricia talked, um, because I could really relate to that description in terms of, you know, um, even childless partners um, like myself, I don't have children, uh, you know, get a lot of meaning from uh, what they do, have a close relationship to uh, their peers, but also their team. And I totally, I totally relate to that. Um, what I have experienced, and I cannot make that comparison between the UK and Germany, to be quite frank, I have not worked as a partner in the UK. Uh, however, I have seen lots of other female partners across EMEA and also um, globally, so I'm in contact with them, so I can kind of compare it to what I'm hearing from them. Um, I think that, um, you know, I've been partner for, for, for five years now, and um, in, the, in the trajectory of becoming partner, I remember that there were a lot fewer women when I started, you know, going into that career track than um, what I'm seeing today. I remember myself walking into a room full of black suits, uh, plus me, uh, that has definitely changed. Um, and, uh, and what I think what has also changed is that we're seeing women who are making partner um, as they are being pregnant at the same time, which I think is a very strong signal right? Um, at least that's what the, the women um, who are having children tell me, um, that this is a very strong signal into the organization that, let me put it that um, simply, that you can make partner despite having kids, if you will. Um, so I think, you know, showing that the process doesn't stop while your life continues at the same time is a very important uh, signal. Um, that 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 women are sending into these organizations today. Yeah, um, uh, and I think I would add to that also that actually many women delay motherhood as well uh, until they've made partner, uh, which is the other side of that. Um, uh, uh, and I'm saying that because um, just a personal experience. I mean, I have a friend who's a partner who delayed uh, motherhood and who had triplets then. So. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when she became a partner so um yeah um, yeah i also saw some um that it was actually easier for women there was a couple of women who did um had several children or two children and one had um, one before before making partner then one after and saying actually it was easier after making partner because you sure clients for example so but of course um you know biology is also there's a constraint there that is um that might complicate things well it's also just sort of relating to this idea of hierarchies across Borders. I mean, this particular friend was in the Far East where they could have staff. Um, and certainly, you know, in places like Germany and the UK, um, women are dealing with work and home responsibilities on their own. Uh, whereas in some cultures, it's much more acceptable to, to uh, you know, have help. Um, so uh, I think, um, thank you for those uh, contributions. I think we can change um, the direction of the discussion slightly again and uh, ask um, Elizabeth to speak a little bit to the question of uh, how men can also become change makers for gender equality um, in the workplace. Elizabeth. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Thank you for asking, um, Ed Suki. You know, when we look at um, how gender is discussed, it's often seen as a women's issue. And I feel that, you know, we 
burden a lot of things onto women, right? So women have to make partner, they have to develop the confidence, they have to do all of those things, but also then, you know, make workplaces more gender equal on top of everything else they're doing. So it seems to me that, you know, it might be time to also call upon men to take a more active role in making gender equality happen and actually ensuring that um, gender is not only something for women, but actually affects men too. And I love the examples in Patricia's book about about, um, you know, those men who, um, you know, were taking time out of working, you know, supporting um, their wives, you know, as they were pursuing partnership. So kind of you know, inversing um, the breadwinner roles, if you will. And we have many examples of that, you know, around. And obviously, because the critique of that often is you don't change much, you just inverse it. So what's the benefit? So yeah, the private life, you know, obviously it's hugely important, but I think also in the workplace, we have to ensure that men actually take an active role in creating gender equality. So they need to develop a point of view. They need to have a vision for how gender equality should look and why they engage on it. They need to um, engage, you know, in practices that make it happen, right? So ensuring that, you know, you deal with resistance to gender equality by calling out behavior that perpetuates gender inequalities. But also thinking about role models, and we talked about role models before, women having other women as their role models, but also thinking about how men can be role models for how, how gender inclusion can look. So if you have a middle manager or a senior leader um, who models how gender inclusion can look and how you lead an inclusive meeting or how you deal with you know, questions around pregnancy or menopause or these types of issues, you know, men need to develop these competencies to also act as role models for others. Us. And, you know, in these discussions, we, we need to ensure that, you know, men you know, are engaged um, in these conversations and also take appropriate actions to become part of, you know, the, the cause for change, right? Because if you look at those women who make partner and are then burdened with being a role model for others and changing the entire organizational culture, it seems like a lot to put onto individuals and in particular women. And I think we need to um, broaden our um, idea of how gender equality um, and change agents can look. Sure, thank you. Um, Katrina. Wow, it's very difficult to add something uh, to that because I think Elizabeth has uh, has uh, described that so comprehensively. Um, I think one one very practical um, uh, observation maybe is that you know as we're still working on having as much women in partnership as we have men in partnership, I think it's worthwhile also recognizing that the capacity of those women who have become partner is limited. Big surprise. So, um, you know, sometimes there's discussions like, um, okay, we have this role and uh, we really want to give it to a woman, um, but that woman already has two, three other roles and uh, uh, and is already, you know, the day is already full. So I think there needs to be, you know, a, a balanced conversation around, okay, um, which roles would we then maybe like to pick and uh, how, how do we make sure we're not like overburdening uh, these, these women in these positions because there's only so much you can do within a day. Sure, thank you. Um, anything to add, Patricia? No, there's not much to add to that. You're on mute, sorry. Hey, yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to have to um, Mind you that um, sent sent Elizabeth's book around as well that has um, come out on this sub on this topic. Um, I do think that in Germany, for example, um, you know, I was talking in my book about the relationships that they that they formed, and a lot of them were with men. And I think that um, you know we have to. I think we're in the conclusion of my book, I write a little bit about you know how it's becoming more and more difficult as well to to make these relationships happen as well in order um, sort of these um, homo um, heterosocial relationships um, again because we are um, you know proceduralizing everything. So um, and and yeah, I think we need to have a bit more faith, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, let Let's change the direction uh, again a little bit and ask. Um, Katrina to talk a little bit about what steps might be necessary to achieve a uh, lasting cultural change. Um, so that's a huge question, um, uh -huh. but let me pass to you. <laughs> that's a big one. Um, so um, I guess a couple of things there. Um, we, we already touched upon this element around being able to really measure 
uh, whether change is actually happening, right? And I think this is something to definitely, definitely concentrate on. And I think there needs to be a very honest conversation, um, a very honest behavior-based conversation in terms of what needs to start, stop, and continue. Um, you know, that uh, is something very uh, a classical way of looking at it from an agility point of view and um, bring that into something that we call KBIs. So not KPIs, but KBIs, meaning key behavioral indicators. So really jotting down, okay, what's the behavior that I want to see? What's the behavior that I don't want to see? And what's the behavior that I am already seeing that I want people to continue? And, you know, we talk so much about culture and cultural change, and people feel that's a very abstract thing. Um, it's very uh, hard to grasp. And uh, I think we need to be very concrete about it in terms of the behaviors that we want people to display or not display and really um, be specific um, with examples, with use cases. What is a, a good example? What is a bad example? So um, in this particular uh, situation, please do this, don't do that, and really um, put this out there. So don't you know write just something like a cultural manifest that people can read and that is also important but make it as tangible as possible for people so they can understand how they can in their daily, in their daily life, in the firm, you know, uh, behave themselves in a way that is supportive or non-supportive. So I would definitely advocate this KBI based conversation there. Thank you. Um, uh, actually, I was uh, going to ask Katrina, you, you um, are responsible for change in uh, the Middle East and the Far East and various other sort of parts of the world. I wonder if you can speak a little bit about your experience um, or, or the firm's experience in pushing change in these different settings. Yeah. Well, um, I've had the chance to, you know, collaborate with uh, amazing people across EMEA uh, on different types of projects, both internal and for external clients. And I think um, the, the great advantage of, you know, having this broad network is that you can be a lot more culturally sensitive as you would be if you would just deliver it from one place in the world and then just kind of pretend that you, that you understand it all, regardless of where you are. Um, I think oftentimes we have in mind that there's big difference between places like maybe Germany and Mina and then in practice, you realize that there is already quite some big differences between Germany and France, right? So, um, and this this goes back to, you know, speaking the language, understanding how you phrase things in another language, what is politeness in one language, was what is not politeness in another language. Also understanding, you know, the, the concepts that lie behind uh, the language that you may not even be able to translate, right? So I think, you know, having that, that sensitivity um, as you, you know, pull together a team um, and making sure that you have enough different perspectives on that team. Um, we talk a lot about things like highest performing teams, for instance, from, uh, it, from, from where I uh, deliver to my clients. And, and part of that needs to be on the, on the one hand diversity, so diversity in perspective, but then also inclusiveness in terms of, okay, how do I understand that diversity better and how do I make sure I make use of it in the best possible way? Okay, thank you. Actually, um, th there's a question um, which is perhaps relevant to this, um, which you might address. Um, what do you think about the business case for gender diversity at the top? And should we move away from this discourse still so much prevalent in the firms? Mm. This kind of... case, mm, just to make sure I understand that correctly, business case in terms of a quota, well, in mm. terms of saying that if you have more women, if you're trying to persuade firms by saying, um, well, if you have more women, these great things happen for your corporate governance or your stock market performance will be better or that they found these. So that's um, in the academic literature then discussed as trying to get firms to have more women on the mm. basis that there's a business case to do so. Well, I think um, to me, this is actually quite straightforward, to be quite honest, because um, the women that I'm perceiving are financially uh, highly um, successful. So, you know, what this business chaos eventually entails that if you have diversity, you will be more successful in the marketplace because, big surprise, the marketplace is diverse and people like to talk to, you know, people who reflect to some extent, um, their own 
you know, style and identity and personality. So it's very smart to, you know, try and match them together so that people can actually feel represented to some extent. So, and you can definitely track that down in the numbers. Um, so if you, if you put effort into this and, you know, carved out the effects of bringing the right people together so they can make the best of the competencies, you know, across genders, across all types of identities that we're talking about. Um, you may have seen that in my course of studies, I've looked um, quite deeply into things like intersectionality. Um, so um, I think um, that is pretty straightforward what we need to do there. So yes, um, I guess my answer, my, my short answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. Do you want me to go back to the big culture question you asked before? You certainly can. Or, or uh, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, this is something, you know, when I um, spoke with um, CEOs, they often brought up this issue um, on why they support gender equality is because they want to see um, lasting change. They want to leave a legacy. And the very next sentence was normally, but it's very hard um, to achieve it. It's very hard to move the needle on gender equality and to achieve cu culture change that outlasts their own tenure. So there was this tension in the discussions, you know, that I had with those CEOs, including one which was actually with a managing partner from a large professional services firm um, who said that, you know, totally committed to gender equality, wants to leave uh, a firm, you know, behind that is more gender equal. So that was, you know, big on his agenda. Um, and he told me, and I remember it like it was yesterday, he told me, Elizabeth, I could make, you know, um, people paint the building pink tomorrow, but I would struggle um, to make my middle managers understand the importance of gender equality and to display appropriate behaviors right so kind of clearly speaking to um, this idea of intellectual understanding why gender equality is important to practically then translating it and that's why I love what Karina was mentioning where in her response earlier that she talks about the behaviors that you want to see and I think for many individuals it's absolutely key to see how that looks right so just take the example of calling out behavior right so we often say that oh you need to call out behavior that is sexist and racist but how does it actually look how do you do that so this practical um, support and the behavior that support um, these actions that need much more explanation much more training much more insight and I think if we can get that right then the culture change and the legacy might follow but we really have to break it down and unfortunately there will be large parts of you know a firm a professional services firm that will show limited interest even if you link it to um, things like promotions and they will do just the bare minimum to to get over that. So I think there needs to be a much wider change in the importance and actually embedding these behaviors as normal. And then we will see, you know, the, the lasting change that we hopefully want to see. Thank you. Um, May I add something, Suki? Sure, sure, sure. Um, I, I think um, I, I love what you said, Elizabeth. I think it's so important to not just, you know, put it out there in terms of communication, uh, like a one-way communication type of thing but then creating a dialogue um, based on that, and then even go one step further and say, look, let's just try it out, you know, and it's not going to be perfect probably. So everybody's going to make mistakes and um, that's fine. There's a safe space to make mistakes because I think, you know, there's also some sort of, okay, I, I may not get it right in the first place, so I don't even try, you know, I'd rather be silent instead of trying. And, you know, have that conversation too, and be um, very, um, you know, reflective and, and very um, uh, open about this in terms of, okay, let's simulate also something like this. Um, sometimes we work with professional actors, you know, to, to kind of, you know, simulate difficult conversations um, to kind of wire the brain to the fact that this conversation is going to happen, but I can prepare in a safe environment before I'm actually having that situation. Um, thank you. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, open up for some questions now, and um, there are quite a few on the uh, Q&A, so uh, a couple that I've just picked out, um, but do feel free to um, have a look and answer any that you um, quite fancy. But let me start with one, uh, which is for Patricia, actually, um, or any panellist. Um, have you any insights on the impact of perimenopause or menopause 
on women reaching partnership. I think this is a very topical issue at the moment, and I think it's worthy of discussion here in this forum. So, Patricia, let's start with you. Um, yeah, I was actually gunning for the the other question on children, but um, I would say that um, no, I don't. Um, I do know there's a lot of research on this topic. I know um, there's a common friend friend of mine and Elizabeth um, Sarah Riley who's currently doing some research in menopause and just got a get big grant on that as well. And um, I would say that um, you know one of the problems with interviewing partners or interviewing people at the very top of the organization is that you miss out on talking to those who didn't make it to the very top, and so you don't get the view about anyone who um, left the left the organization because they were suffering debilitating um, symptoms or struggling uh, for this amount of time where they were in transition. So um, so I think that's something that I in my research can't um, can't talk to, to about, but perhaps Elizabeth or Katarina can. I mean, yeah, as you already said, it's it's a huge topic, particularly in the UK right now. Fantastic research is happening. So, I mean, um, I think one title of the article is that uh, menopause has its moment, right? So it's it's clearly um, out there and discussed and it's really valuable and important. Um, I'm not specifically sure what effects it has on partnership and professional services firms, but I'm sure, you know, um, a research will look at that eventually. Um, what have I however, also seen, and that is largely, you know, when I engage, you know, those who are, let's say, newer to gender equality as a topic, um, they then go and say, oh, well, you know, that only shows me that you can never employ women because they're either pregnant or they have menopause, right? So it's kind of, you know, <laughs> it, that kind of you know, made my heart sink. And you know, this is kind of an incredibly negative take on, you know, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and, you know, uh, it's kind of, that's, I think, what some people are hearing out of that. Um, but on general, I think it's a fantastic, you know, opportunity to bring that to the fore, but also to bring all sorts of other issues to the for you know also what's happening to men at this age and things like that right so we often uh, pretend it's only women who have hormonal changes and we know that this is not necessarily the case right so um and kind of looking at you know the societal and occupational um consequences of those changes is very important and i would really hope that in the next few years we see much more good research on that topic right um okay um there's another question, which again, perhaps for, perhaps I'll aim this one at Elizabeth because she spoke to the issue of men. Um, the question is, uh, right, men, exclamation uh, mark, not only the fathers of these uh, children, um, but especially the men on the way to partnership in PS, uh, PS firms. What do you think about mandatory paternity leave and or mandatory care leave for sons of elderly parents sustainability in combining a career and care is not a women's issue um careless workers no longer exist i think this is also an important issue for us to address because many of us are stuck in the middle of caring for children but also for elderly parents um and um what is uh, the role of men in this perhaps elizabeth and and of course paternity leave is shared in many European countries already. So, Elizabeth. Yeah. I mean, these things have to be just normalized. You know, it has to be much more normal for men to take these um, uh, types of, of, you know, care and responsibility seriously and to enable a workplace where this is possible. In my own research, I've often seen and heard that men are mocked for these types of behaviors, right? So where you see a lot of hegemonic masculinity happening, where then, you know, if men take um, up those opportunities to care, let's say, for elderly parents, there's often some, you know, snarky remarks, um, slightly ridiculous, you know, that, that they do these types of things, which I think is a form of how hegemonic masculinity is manifesting itself in the workplace. But regardless of that, we see that in many professional services firms, men be become more active fathers. They talk actively about, you know, that they, you know, cannot take certain meetings because they have care responsibilities. And, you know, I have many examples in my own research about that, um, you know, of how, you know, you shift meetings with your boss because you need to pick up your child from school and things like that. Um, but the same is obviously true for other caring responsibilities, like for um, elderly and parents or um, disabled individuals, where we increasingly see the need for workplaces to become more flexible 
flexible, where it is not enough to rely on a specific type of woman to do this care work and where everyone is called um, to action. And I, I see that there's more awareness of that in professional services firms where policies are being put in place. Not sure you can make it mandatory um, and what consequences that would have, but having the option and slowly normalizing that over time can already get us you know, a long way to, to making these things much more acceptable and for allowing uh, more sustainable careers, as you've put it. Thank you, um, Elizabeth. Um, okay, there's a couple more questions here, we, and we have time, so I'm going to make the most of it. Um, there's one here which perhaps Katharina can um, address. Uh, what more can universities be doing to prepare future accountants, women and men, for the organizational environment they will encounter in professional service firms. So far, we tend to focus on developing technical knowledge. Now, perhaps I should address that one, but let me put it another way. Um, Katharina, what would you like to see? What qualities would you like to see in uh, the entrance uh, to mm -hmm. your firm, for example? Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important one. It's probably an important one, regardless of whether you look at it from a UK or a German standpoint, I would assume. Um, so I go back to, to the university I came from regularly to talk to graduates um, about uh, what the consulting uh, role in practice looks like. And I do get that question all the time, right? So I think we're not focusing enough on the meta competencies that are needed. Um, things like networking, like collaboration, teaming, um, things like um, creating visibility, being proactive. You know, these are the classical things that as you're entering uh, the consulting job that you will need. And I think um, it is very hard from my perception for those graduates to actually name those competencies, even if they have them. So they are actually lacking the words, almost the language to, to express these capabilities, even if they have them. And instead focusing on, um, well, quite academic terms, probably even um, depending on uh, which stage in the academic system, the academic system they are kind of jumping off. And um, it's almost like, you know, training them to uh, use different different language when when uh, moving out of academia and into consulting. And I think the bridge could be it could be a lot smoother if we uh, ha had that uh, conversation earlier and if we practice this earlier. This type of you know talking about um, the person, your personality, and the, and the competencies that you have. So I think having that training, if you will, um, not only on the meta competencies per se but also on being able to display those and talk about those. This would be important for, for young talents. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> there's another um, interesting question here, uh, right at the end. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned to be wary of performance management systems. And I think this was in respect of you know, talking about how to um, measure uh, performance on the way up to partnership. Um, can you give examples is the question. And is it that performance management systems are gendered, uh, which would link to the business case, and or that they have limits to manage equality and diversity? So is this for me? Uh, it's for anybody who wants to take it. I was wondering... <laughs> Answering this um, question on children's, I think performance management systems, um, you know, they just, what I'm saying is that they come at a cost, you know, when you try to proceduralize everything, we've seen this in the universities, the ref, uh, the fact that 15 years ago, no one had a line manager, no one had to do appraisals, and now we're spending our year hamstring away, trying to find bullet points for our appraisal, um, you know, and it just individualizes everything. It means that we're no longer doing citizenship because it's actually good to be a good person and a good colleague, and you're expecting to work with other people for the next 15 to 20 years, but you're doing it because you're hamstring away and you know that in June, your line manager is going to ask, well, what have you filled in? And it also encourages you to compete with yourself, you know, because you know what objectives you set, you have to go and meet them, um, you're competing with other people yourself, and it just is what Richard said it calls corrosive it really um, makes work um you know less less meaningful i think um but i'd like to i'd like to hear on that actually from um from elizabeth because you've, you're doing some work on automation as well um as artificial intelligence and hiring so i'd love to hear what you think on this question 
probably the ultimate corrosion of character, as Richard Sennett um, would call it, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, because I mean, obviously, artificial intelligence is, you know, um, measuring these things and is um, putting them into a system um, where then a specific prediction is being made. Um, and we will see that in performance management systems, for instance, in professional service firms, but beyond, you know, used much more widely, um, where we will use it to predict leaders, we already do that to a certain degree, it will be, I mean, you know, much more the case. And then, you know, I always end up, you know, at a very simple and straightforward um, example that I was given, um, you know, from one professional services firm, which, you know, actually links very well to you, to your book, Patricia, where um, there were women who went on maternity leave and they had often, you know, before they went, they scored always five out of five. They were at the top of the scale. They were top performers. And then they were on maternity leave and their line manager or their middle manager that uh, was um, supervising them didn't know what to give them. And so there was kind of an informal agreement amongst the line managers to give them three out of five. But of course, this was hugely detrimental for women's careers, um, you know, once they had taken up, uh, you know, once they had children and they wanted to go for a promotion because suddenly they went from a top performer from five out of five on most of the criteria to three out of five. And that's a huge drop, right? And, you know, we see that already now having an effect. But if you think about artificial intelligence being used increasingly and where we see subjective um, assessment transformed into this so-called objective data and then fed into a machine to make a prediction, we will see that many of those past inequalities are actually um, cemented into the future and actually, you know, outlasting, you know, their, their actual um, occurrence. And I think that is really problematic. At the same time, it also opens up possibilities of thinking more broadly about what the future of work might entail, particularly in professional services um, work. There is a big question of what work actually has to be done. Much of the work that juniors in those companies would do um, can be done by a machine in the future and already partly is. So what is the role of humans? And I think we have a, a chance here to refine um, what professional services work will look. I'm not of the opinion that these jobs will disappear. I think they will be reshaped. And we have a unique opportunity to reshape them in a way that they are more gender equal or take more consideration of gender. And I think that is probably, um, you know, what we might see in the future. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so we're nearly um, finishing um, or uh, coming to the end of our uh, time. Uh, but just um, before we go, I couldn't help but raise one more question. And perhaps this one's for you, Katharina, since we have you here. And this would really nicely sum up some of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, I mean, obviously, you've made it to partnership at Ernst Young quite quickly. And um, we I wondered uh, what are your top tips for uh, successfully negotiating a route to the top? <laughs> Probably you've been asked many times, so forgive me, but um, anything, a, any, any insights? That's a tough one for, for so little time, I would, would suppose. Um, I, you know, um, I've been very fortunate in terms of, you know, yes, being a hard worker for sure. So nothing came for free. Um, you need to be really good in what you're doing. Everybody has to, no exception for women there. Um, I have been very fortunate that, you know, I've had people opening doors. I also need, I always needed to go through those doors by myself. I would advise others to be courageous. So step in. Um, don't be, you know, don't don't be shy to, to try at least. Um, be very explicit about what you want. Um, it has helped me a lot, you know, being explicit about, I want to become partner. I'm here. Um, I'm taking my space, but then obviously also delivering on the, on the promises, um, that, that you're giving, um, have a broad network. Don't focus on one person. That's going to be that person who is carrying you through, but, you know, broaden your network early on, um, get to know as many people who can say good things about you and, um, yeah, that on the top of my head, that's probably the things I would share here. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for doing that. And apologies for putting you on the spot there. Okay. But actually, it's a lovely way and lovely positive way to actually end the discussion. So um, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Katrina for um, some really interesting insights from the uh, practice uh, viewpoint uh, to Elizabeth for um, your uh, very interesting um, discussion on um, the role that men can play in particular. And Patricia, of course, for initiating 
this uh, discussion and for your amazing book. Um, so perhaps the last couple of words should be left to Patricia and then we'll say goodbye. <laughs> just another thank you thanks everyone to for coming and thank you suki for um, for chairing this event katarina it's been so great to see you again and um and also elizabeth thank you again you know you've been such a supportive um senior person in academia and i think that's really appreciated all the work that you do also for other women so yep thank you everyone and i guess that is um the finish of the event and um, we will hopefully have a recording up um when we can <laughs> work it out so thanks everyone for coming have a good day okay bye bye Thank you. Bye. Bye.